Welcome back everyone for session two. Thanks for sticking around and welcome to the online audience who's joining us here for taking advantage of large market moves. My name is Ed Modla, the Director of Retail Education at the Options Industry Council. This is what we do at uh, OIC, is provide education to the investing public about the listed options product. We have written material, uh, online videos, podcasts, all forms of education for you free of charge. We were founded back in 92 just for this purpose. Uh, so this is what we're here to do. This presentation is going to get into a little bit more of complex strategy. We're going to add some pieces, but along the way, what I'll do is I'll weave in some basic commentary. So we'll break it down and then expand it back and forth as I walk my way through it. That should give something for everybody, no matter what your skill level is. Hopefully we can give you something that's useful today. Here's our disclaimer. Our outline for this session will review a few things uh, from session one, the bull call spread and bear put spread. I'll break that down with some, some basic commentary and motivation there. We're gonna build the complex strategies and look at the risk profile of those, why you would do them, and then what happens at expiration time uh, under various circumstances. First, the bull call spread. And we heard about this already in session one, but I'll start with this. The motivation to do this trade, the core motivation is buying the call option. You're trying to profit from buying a call. That means you're bullish, and let's think about what that means. You're buying a call option which gives you the right to buy shares at a certain price, or the strike price. As the value of the stock rises, the right to pay that fixed price for the stock increases in value. If the stock is trading at 60 and we have the right to buy shares at 70, you might not pay very, very much for that. That's $10 more than you can get in the open market today. But if the stock is up at 80 and we have the right to buy shares at 70, that's already got $10 of inherent value. So quickly you can see that as the stock moves higher in price, the call value increases in value. And that's what we want to capitalize on, a bullish outlook buying the call. That's going to drive our P&L. The call spread comes into play when we're trying to mitigate our risk. We'll analyze how much does this call cost me. It's not going to be cheap to buy something that gives you the right at, to buy shares at a fixed price. It's going to cost you something. Time is included in that price. How much time you have till expiration, how much volatility might there be in the marketplace is all included in that price, so adding a short call option changes the risk profile. We'll sell a call option at a higher strike price. That means we're buying one expensive call, selling one cheaper call option. The difference between the two now becomes our cost. Lower cost of entry, lower risk. We're controlling risk. We also know that by selling a call option, we're obligated to sell or deliver shares that we purchased the right to buy. So we're capping our upside. When you trade options, there's always a give and take, a cost and a benefit. I'll often get asked a question, people will raise their hand and say, well, can't I do this or can't I do that instead? And when I, when I go through a strategy, the answer is always yes. You can change things. Add a piece, subtract a piece, change the expirations, change the quantities. You can always do something different to tailor it for your market outlook. What you're going to inevitably find is that you get an advantage by doing something different and you give something up. There's a cost and a benefit. And that's the same thing with the bull call spread. Selling a call gives you the advantage of lower cost and what you give up is the potential for huge gains if the stock rallies. Bear put spread is very similar. This would be for a bearish outlook. Buying a put option, let's remind ourselves, buying a put gives us the right to sell shares of stock. As the share price drops, the right to sell at a particular price gains value. It increases in value. We're trying to profit off of a bearish outlook. Many of you likely do not trade short stock or hold short stock positions in your portfolio. So in that case, taking advantage of a bearish environment leaves you with very few choices if you're not using options. There's not much you can do without options if you're bearish other than maybe fluctuate your cash position and toggle your exposure to the market by going heavier into cash when you're bearish. With options, you can actually try and profit and capitalize on that move lower. And similar 
to the bull call spread here, we're buying an option. We know that's going to cost us. We're paying for time. We're paying for volatility. Let's mitigate that cost by selling a lower strike price put option that's cheaper, giving us the obligation to buy those shares back. We can't make money all the way down to zero, uh, but we're willing to accept that to reduce the cost of the bear put spread. Now, one question that came up in the previous session that I wanted to address here was, can you outline using the bear put spread to protect a portfolio or a stock instead of speculating? Well, here we're speculating. Stock's going to move down. I want to buy a put option and profit off of that. What if you own stock or you're trying to protect a portfolio? Could you use this to do that? And the answer is yes. Buying a put option is very similar to buying insurance like you would on anything else. If you own stock at $70 a share, buying a put option, giving you the right to sell those shares at 60, protects the position from a massive decline. The premium you pay for the option is similar to premium you pay on any other insurance policy, whether it's car, home, or your life. You're paying up front for the right to own an insurance policy. The put spread is a little bit different. You know, I just outlined the protective put, owning stock and buying a put option. That's classic buying insurance. You could also sell a much cheaper put option down at a lower strike price. If you do that, it's still protection. What you've done there is you've lowered the cost of the insurance and you've accepted less protection. So if you're doing this as insurance, by spreading it off, the cost is going to be reduced. But now, instead of being protected all the way down to the stock uh, price of zero or all the way down for full protection, you're obligated to buy that stock back at a certain price, that strike price of the short put. So less cost, less protection. That makes sense. And you may decide uh, that you would use this strategy if you don't want protection all the way down to zero. You may think, well, I, I want to protect my portfolio beyond 5% or 3%, but I don't think this is going to sell off more than 12 or 15%. I don't need all that protection. You can go down there, find the put strike that is at that level, and sell it and reduce the cost of your insurance and reduce the protection that you're afforded. So now we're going to start to expand on the two-sided trades, the bull call and the bear put. As I said, the motivation, the driving force behind profitability of each of those verticals is buying the outright option. On the call side, it's buying the call, and on the put side, it's buying the put. We're adding the shorts to reduce our cost and control our risk. Now, how about a situation where you think a stock might move in a to a large extent, but in either direction? Not sure which, which way it's going to go. And I'll clarify, uncertainty doesn't mean you have no idea where this stock is going at all. Uncertainty means you think the stock will move, you're just not sure which way. And there are circumstances where this will occur. If you're trading stock, there's not much you can do there. Uh, certainly when you have major earnings releases or announcements, a lot of uncertainty will be in the market as far as what direction. But there also could be technical reasons when you're reaching new highs or when a stock is consolidating, you may think it's ready for a breakout. It's going to set new highs and it's either going to take off or it's going to fail miserably. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons why you can think a big move is coming, but be really unclear of which way that's going to be. Think about the motivations I described earlier. If you're bullish, you want to buy a call. If you're bearish, you buy a put. Now, you can add pieces to that to change how the risk profile looks. If we think a big move is coming and we want to capitalize on both possible directions, that means we have to buy both. We have to buy a call for the upside participation and buy a put for the downside participation. And we're going to start there and then add pieces. Now, who's familiar with the iron condor strategy? Some of you raising your hands. I'm, before I flip this into a, a, a long strategy, let's talk about iron condors for just a minute. This is a four-part strategy. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's really just taking these two vertical spreads that I've mentioned and merging them together and doing both of them to come up with the four sides. The iron condor is selling a call spread and selling a put spread together, doing all four sides. The idea here 
is that the market or the underlying stock will not move very much or will be range bound. And that reminds me of, of something I like to say with, just with respect to buying versus selling options. When you buy options, you want movement. You want the stock to move somewhere. If it's calls you own, you want movement to the upside. If it's puts you own, you want movement to the downside. If you own both, you want movement either way, but you want fluctuation, volatility, movement. When you sell options, you want the opposite. You want the stock to stay away from your strike prices. If you sell a call spread, you want the stock to stay lower, below your strikes and away from your call spread strikes. If you sell a put spread, you want the stock to stay up above those strikes and away from the options that you sold. In this case, we're selling both calls and puts. The only way to get that to work is for the stock to stay away from both of them or in between all the strikes. So this is truly a neutral strategy. Selling a lower strike call, buying a higher one. Selling a higher strike put, buying a lower one. We want the stock to stay in between. What if we don't have that opinion and we actually think the stock's moving? Well, we can flip the iron condor around, turn it on its head, and put together what amounts to a long iron condor. Long strike determination. Now, this is, this is an interesting conversation. A common question that comes across our desk is, how do you select strikes? I know what the strategy is, how it works, but how do you select strikes? We know what we want to do here. We want to capitalize on a move that can happen higher or lower. We want to buy a call, we want to buy a put, and then we're going to end up later, we're going to sell two strikes at, at, uh, at lower cost. But we're starting with the long strikes. If the stock is at 50, the first question you have to ask yourself is, how far do I think this might go up or down? You have to have some sort of backdrop or market analysis that leads you to particular strike price choices on the long side. So if the stock's at 50, and we're thinking to ourselves, we might get a decent move of 10% of or more once this news is released, you're going to start to look at that 10% that area as the strike prices you'd like to buy. In this case, we're going to go a little bit, a little bit lower than that, about 6%. Stock's at 50, let's buy the 53 calls. That'll give us some nice room to profit if the stock goes up into the mid or high 50s. And we'll choose a similar move down. If it's a big move lower, we're thinking about 6%. We'll go down to the 47 put and we'll buy that one. So now we've got the put strikes long in place. Haven't paid any attention to the price just yet, but we know how far we think the stock might move and it's helping us decide what strike prices to choose on the long side. Choosing short strikes depends on possibly a couple of things. First of all, you may actually have an opinion on how far this stock might move. Your analysis, whether it's technical or whether you're uh, using fundamental analysis, you may see that I think the stock's going to make a big move, but it certainly isn't going to make a move larger than this. Maybe it's 15%, 18%. If you have that confident opinion, that is where you set your short strikes. In general, your short strikes in these spreads are set exactly where you think the stock might get to, but not go through. Because remember, we're giving up potential gains when we sell options. So you may have an opinion on where the stock's going, and if you do, the magnitude of that move is going to help you decide where the short strikes are. What if you don't? Oftentimes you think, hey, a big move's coming. I really don't know how far this thing might run. I want to capitalize on it. I want the upside and downside exposure, so I'm buying a call and a put. I want to reduce my cost by selling strikes, but I don't know how far it's going to go. Then your short strike selection really comes down to managing money, managing risk tolerance. Check your strike prices, look at your options chain, and see what can I get for the 55 call or the 45 put. Go out a little further and see what can I get for those other strike prices and try to find a sweet spot for you where you can make a healthy gain on the trade, but you're also receiving premium that's worth it. And as we walk through the example, I'll outline this as well. Another key note when you're selling options, with respect to any spread selling options, what you're trying to do is capture the premium, specifically the time value. That's the reason why you're selling an option to begin with. So you have to make sure the amount of premium you receive is actually worth it to you as you go further and further out in strike price 
the premiums are going to start to drop. Eventually, you'll see the premiums are so low, you decide, well, it's just not even worth selling an option at that low price to take on the obligation that comes along with it. So that's how you can select long strikes and select short strikes. We know our ultimate goal here we're accomplishing is exposure to both upside and downside potential and reduced cost because we're adding uh, the short strikes. It's going to look a lot better in an example. Uh, this particular ticker symbol, TIRZ, tires, is an auto parts manufacturer and a court ruling is expected. Uh, the stock's trading at 58. We think when this ruling comes out, the stock's going to make a huge move one way or the other. Now, of course, I'll say right here, in this particular situation, uh, the whole market may be expecting a big move. And when that happens, there's a lot of uncertainty around potential movement of stocks, and the volatility priced into the options contracts might be elevated. I'll talk more about volatility as we walk through this, but options become more expensive when volatility is high and uncertainty is high. So a court ruling expected would be one of those circumstances. But let's just say we think a big move is coming, and maybe our opinion is that a bigger move is coming than the market expects, and that would lead us to this kind of a trade. There's certainly different things you can do. Buying a straddle would simply be buying a call and a put at the same strike price. If you do that, you've got upside exposure, downside exposure, but you're also paying for two at-the-money options. That's going to cost and you're not mitigating uh, the risk exposure when you buy a straddle. We could buy a strangle. That would be buying an out-of-the-money call, also buying an out-of-the-money put. So we have the right to buy shares, we have the right to sell them, we've got upside and downside exposure. That's what we want. But again, we're buying two options. It's not going to cost as much as the straddle would, but buying two options. We have all the exposure we want. Stock can rally significantly. We'd keep money. We'd keep making money. If the stock sells off dramatically, we'd keep making money. But it's going to cost us to do that. Or we can do this condor idea. So different choices that we have as we walk through this. And we're going to look at the most complex of these, the condor. I think this is useful to, to sort of push uh, the education a little further. Once you start looking at these four-legged strategies and all these different circumstances, all of a sudden, the three-sided ones and the two-sided ones and the single ones look a lot easier. So it's nice to push this uh, educational lesson a little bit further. And that's what we're going to do here. Stock is trading at 58. And there are four options. Remember, four options that we have to trade. We're doing a call spread on the upside. We're doing a put spread on the downside. So our analysis has determined that we think a nice move in the stock is coming. Let's just say we think about a 15% move might occur in the shares after this announcement is released. Stock's trading at 58. So we go down about 10% down to the 52 strike, and we decide 25 cents is trading for, you know, the market knows there's uncertainty, but I think there's a bigger move coming than the market is currently pricing in. So we look at the 52 put, and we decide that buying it for 25 cents is what we want to do. We uh, continue with the long strikes on the call side. We go up about the same amount, about 10%, and choose the 64 calls, trading for 35 cents. Now we know the long options. We have to decide on which ones our, uh, our short strikes are going to be. Well, we think about a 15% move is coming, so we'll go close to that, about 13 plus percent away from the current stock price, and sell a few options that are going to reduce our overall cost, the 50 put and the 66 call. Now, I do want to point one thing out, and this may be going a little more advanced. Uh, each particular strike price has its own unique implied volatility level. Pricing models require some volatility assumption to be put in in order to price an options contract. And it makes sense. We're buying an option today, and we have until expiration to profit on it. So the market's going to say, well, how volatile might this stock be between today and expiration? Nobody knows what that's going to be. So it's forecasted. And that's why it's called implied volatility. It's used to price options contracts. And then there's a unique implied volatility at each strike price. For those of you familiar with volatility and usually how they're plotted along the curve, normally you would see more demand for put options. And that's because investors 
money managers, institutions are normally using put options to protect portfolios and to protect their long investments. It's not too often that call options are used as protection against a portfolio, but yes. So generally speaking, put options trade at higher implied volatility levels and higher prices than calls do when you're looking equidistant from the current stock price. That's normal. We didn't do normal here when we put together our example to highlight the fact that even though you'll commonly see in stocks this, this dynamic where equidistant from the current price puts are trading more than calls, you'll see that undoubtedly in index options, in most equity options, but it's not a rule. It doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes stocks are trading up so quickly and they're up every single day that the investing public decides, I don't need put options, I want the calls. And the demand for calls goes up and for puts goes down. And that skew, which is what it's called, the, the volatility skew could invert and become opposite. And all of a sudden your calls are trading more than your puts are. And that's what this showcases, that possibility. The most common breach of the volatility skew normal situation, I would say, is commodities, gold, silver, those commodities don't necessarily move in either direction with more velocity. The price of silver can go up just as quickly as it can go down. So you normally don't see the skew favored one side or the other. In that case, you'd see more of a flat skew, where volatility across strike prices might be flat or more equal. And of course, it could invert or go into a normal situation depending on what's happening in that commodity today. But the point is that prices can, can look different, and it's not necessarily always true that put options will trade for more than their call uh, counterparts. So here's our trade setup. We have the four options that we know we're going to trade. We have the put spread, uh, buying the 52 put and selling the 50 put, and those are our execution prices. We have the call spread on the right, uh, buying the 64 call, selling the 66. All of that put together comes out to a net debit of 37 cents. Now what's the most we can make, Now I will, I will stipulate here, this is the most we can make at expiration. The stock can't be in two places at once at expiration, so we can only make money on the upside or the downside, but not both. If the stock does rally above both strikes to the upside, we can capture that full value of the call spread, which is $2. We paid 37 up front, will be able to pull two dollars back out of it. Same thing on the downside. If the stock drops through the strikes below 50, we can pull two dollars out of the market. Remember what that means. We own the right to buy shares at 64 and then we are obligated to sell them at 66 on the upside. Downside, we own the right to sell at 52. We're obligated to buy back at 50. That would be a two dollar gain for us if we can accomplish either of those. And that leads us to maximum gain of that two dollars minus our upfront cost or 163. Now I said maximum gain at expiration because it's certainly possible before we reach expiration that the stock rallies, we sell the call spread for a profit, we keep watching, all of a sudden the stock turns around and it sells off and we're able to sell the put spread for something. So during the life of the options, the profit and loss uh, is dictated by stock movements and your position management techniques at expiration, we can say one thing for sure, the stock can't be in two places at once. So what happens at expiration? We'll walk through the different situations and, and outline some key concepts and some basic material that would apply, again, not for this strategy specific, but any strategy that you're about to employ. Here's the general profit and loss graph. For those of you, some of you raised your hands that you traded the iron condor. This is flipping it around. Instead of having profit in between the strikes, we have a loss in between the strikes. Remember to my description of motivation in the beginning, this makes sense. We need the stock to move. We're long options. We're buying them. We need the stock to move. If it doesn't move, we lose. That's the whole point of doing this trade in the first place. So now, at expiration, if the shares finish below 50, this is one of the two situations where we can maximize our gain. This, the call spread is out of the money. Both of those expire worthless. So don't have to worry about that. The put spread is entirely in the money. So if the shares are down at, say, 47 or 48, what will happen is our 52 put will get exercised. We'll sell shares at 52. 
Our 50 put that we sold will get assigned. We'll buy them back at 50. We'll capture that $2. We paid 37 up front, so we'll have our maximum gain. Now, as was pointed out a few times in, in the first session, what happens if the stock is at $49.98? Just a few pennies underneath that 50 line. This is a very common uh, question that I receive. Well, in that case, you have uncertainty. When you sell an options contract, you're constantly trying to figure out or evaluate what's the likelihood of me being assigned. From an educational perspective, I'd have to say you're never 100% sure. Now, that's not really true, because when an option is deep in the money or out of the money, you know what's going to happen. But you're always trying to evaluate what's the likelihood that the holder is going to exercise, because they can exercise for whatever reason they choose, even if it's financially illogical. They have the right to do so. So you're trying to figure out what's the likelihood of getting assigned. Well, if I'm short the 50 put and the stock's down at 49, 48, 47, I can feel pretty comfortable that I'm going to get assigned. What if the stock's at 49, 98? The owner of the put option has a decision to make. They may or may not decide that they want to exercise that contract. That leaves the put writer or seller, which is what we are, with uncertainty over what, what's going to happen. If we want to make sure that we don't wake up Monday morning with a short stock position, there's only one thing we can do. Buy back the 50 put. In this case, we'd be buying back, or not buying back, we'd be selling the entire put spread. Now, we know it's worth $2. Are we going to be able to sell it for $2? No. If it's only worth 2 and that's all it could ever be worth, who's going to buy it for $2? Nobody. So we'll try to sell this spread in the open market because we have that assignment uncertainty, and we'll try to get as close to $2 as we possibly can. We'll maximize every penny we can and try to get as much of that $2 as we can out of it. But remember when you sell options, keep that in mind. The buyer can do whatever they want, and you have to figure out where is that level. It's a very, if it's a very volatile stock, maybe 49.80 leaves you with uncertainty. You just don't know. In my entire career of trading, uh, and it's only happened to me a handful of times where I was surprised about getting assigned or surprised about not getting assigned, but it happens, and you have to be aware of that and make sure you take the, the appropriate measures. Here we have stock between 50 and 52, so here, in between our strike prices. Once again, call spread is worthless. That goes away. In this instance, it's a little more imperative that we take action because the 52 put is in the money. We own that. That gives us the right to sell shares of stock. The 50 put is out of the money. It's not going to be assigned. It goes away. If we take no action whatsoever, we'll be short stock. That's probably not something we want to have. We might not even be allowed to have that. You might be getting a call from your brokerage firm in a situation like this saying, hey, you're about to get, uh, you have an in-the-money put option. It's going to leave you with a short stock position. They may tell you you need to take action. So in this case, the course of action would be sell the 52 put. If you could sell the 50 put for anything, you would try to do so, but you probably couldn't. But you would try to sell the 52 put for whatever you could. If you had to close out the whole spread, you would do something uh, with, with respect to a cheap price on the 50 put. But taking action here is imperative. And it's a little different on the put side than it is on the call side, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. This one's easy. If it's in between the two, the two center strikes, if it's in between 52 and 64, all the options expired worthless. We lost our upfront cost, and we have nothing to show for the trade. We experienced our, our, our uh, maximum loss. Shares finishing between 64 and 66, so in between strikes, but now on the upside. I said this is a little bit different. The reason why it's different is because on the downside, undoubtedly, we don't want to end up with short stock. On the upside, it's possible that we've changed our bullish thesis and we now want long stock. It's possible. So if the stock is in between 64 and 66, we know the puts expire worthless out of the money. On the upside, our 64 call is in the money. It has value. The 66 call is out of the money with no value. We don't expect to get assigned there. So now we're left with a decision. As the call holder, what do we do? Two choices. Sell it before we reach the closing bell on expiration day and get what we can for it. Or, as I said, depending on what your, your outlook was, in our case, 
There was a major news announcement. We thought a big move was coming. We didn't know which way. So we put on this trade to capitalize in either direction. Now we got the direction. Went from 58 up to 65. We may decide now, all of a sudden, it's going higher. If the news was positive. This stock is going up into the 70s. Maybe you decide, let's pony up the cash and buy shares. In that case, you would exercise the 64 call and keep the trade going and continue to profit on the upside. And the last case here is shares finishing above 66. What happens here? Put spread again expires worthless. It's out of the money. Both of our call options are in the money. We'll exercise the 64s. That gives us the right to buy shares at 64. We expect to be assigned on the 66 call that we sold. So we'll be selling shares $2 higher, capturing the full $2 value of the spread, minus our upfront cost of 37, leaving us with $1.63 or $163. And once again, if you're close, and this, this pin risk idea of being close to your strike and not being sure what's gonna happen only applies to the strikes you've sold. In this case, the 66 call we sold, if the stock closes at 66.05 or 66.10, we might not be sure whether or not we're gonna be assigned. And I'll talk a little bit about that process because some of you might, might not be familiar. Marty touched on this before. If the call holder communicates nothing to their brokerage firm about what they want to do, the industry has to have some kind of a default process. Now what does the industry do if the call holder doesn't tell us what their intention is? In that case, the industry will compare the strike price to the last traded price in the stock during regular trading hours on expiration day and determine its moneyness status. Is it in the money or is it out of the money? If it's in the money based on that analysis, then the option is going to get exercised on the holder's behalf. If it's not in the money, the option will be abandoned at the uh, option holder's uh, behest. It'll be a decision made for them because they didn't tell their firm what decision that they wanted to make. Oftentimes, investors will ask, what was the closing price used? They want to know. Are these options going to be subject to this process or not? And it's usually investors who have a short position. They'll say, hey, what was the last traded price that you've got on your screen? I'm short the 66 call. And I might say to them, well, I don't know. It was, you know, it was 59.98. And they'll say, okay, good. It's out of the money. I say, well, not good necessarily because the option holder can be watching after hours activity and they can see maybe the stock starts to tick higher. Maybe the market moves higher after hours and that price relationship becomes a little bit distorted. Usually option holders have roughly say 60 minutes after the closing bell where they can evaluate any after hours activity, any news that might come out. They have some time to decide, do I wanna exercise this option or not? And they paid for the right to do that no matter where the stock closes. So it's important to be careful when you're short a, an option and the stock price is very close to the strike price at expiration. If you have uncertainty, uh, then you'll want to go ahead and close it out. Sometimes you'll have uncertainty and you will, you'll be okay with that. And you might just determine for yourself, well, if I'm assigned on this, that's okay. And if I'm not assigned, that's okay too. But it's important to have the knowledge and understanding of how that works so you can make the appropriate decision. So that's the iron, uh, the long iron condor. We're gonna go through a similar strategy and I'll mention a few different things here. It, it looks very similar, we're just gonna change it a little bit the iron condor, as we said, it, it gives you the opportunity to profit with a move in either direction, and you've limited your risk by selling cheaper options outside of that. Uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to go to an iron butterfly, what is that? Well, you're bringing those two long strikes that you bought, the call and the put, you're bringing them together, and you're buying them at the same strike price. So effectively, you're buying a straddle. That's what a straddle is, buying at the same strike price. The iron butterfly on the long side is buying the straddle and then selling a strangle or similarly selling a cheaper call on the upside and a cheaper put on the downside. When you do this, you've changed the risk profile a bit. Now it makes sense, first of all, if we're moving the strike price on the call down and we're buying that and we're moving the strike price on the put up and we're buying that, are we gonna pay more or less? 
we're going to pay more. Both of those options are going to cost more. A lower strike call is going to cost us more. A higher strike put is going to cost us more. So now we have a much higher initial cost when we choose our long strikes. It's a heck of a lot easier. You don't have to decide how far to go away from the current stock price. But now we have a, an elevated cost and a little bit of a different analysis when we're choosing the short strikes because the cost uh, has been increased. So here's how that looks. Same stock price as before. Stock is currently trading at 58. And we're going to look right at the 58 line, thinking, well, we're not sure where the stock's going. It's going one way or the other. Let's buy a straddle, buy the 58 call and buy the 58 put. Now, these prices are exaggerated to get the point and drive the point home. Uh, you can see here the cost of those two options up over $4. That's quite a bit. So now that we know what we're paying, we know what strikes and how much that's going to cost us, we look out to decide what puts am I going to sell and what calls am I going to sell. You can choose any ones you want, but this is where you find that, that uh, ideal area for you where you get to profit a healthy amount, but you're also receiving enough premium to make it worth your while. And in this case, we go down uh, to the 52 line, which is about 10% out of the money, and we sell that put, and we go up to the 64 line. So a similar type of analysis could occur here based on our circumstances. We do not think the stock's going to make much more of a move beyond 10%. Whichever way it goes, 10% is about all there's going to be. So we go down about that level and sell a put there, and we go up to the upside and sell a call 10% away from the current price. Net debit, $3.50. That's quite a bit more than we had uh, doing the Condor, but now we start to make money a little bit quicker. So again, that trade-off, cost-benefit, advantage, disadvantage. What's the disadvantage to the Iron Fly versus the Condor? We're paying a lot more, so our cost structure looks different. The risk profile is going to be skewed a bit against us. However, since we're buying options at the money, they'll start to develop intrinsic value more quickly and we should be able to profit at a little bit better uh, range. So our range of profitability should be more favorable to us. Maximum risk here, like any time you buy options, the maximum risk is how much you pay up front. In this case, $350 or $350. At expiration, here is our profit and loss graph. Uh, prior to expiration, you don't know what this looks like. Uh, it's, it's impossible to draw an accurate P&L graph prior to expiration. And why is that? Because prior to expiration, you have unknown factors involved in the value of the options contract, specifically volatility. You have to input a volatility assumption prior to expiration in order to retrieve a value. Now, you can do that. You can go to our website or other websites and use an options calculator to estimate volatility. Uh, our calculator, for example, will let you select a stock symbol, put in a stock price, you can move it wherever you want, strike price of the option, a volatility assumption that you have to put in, you can change the expiration dates, and then you can retrieve what you decide is an estimated value for what these options might be worth if the stock moves X percent and there's still two weeks or three weeks or four weeks left. It's very much an imperfect science, but it can be done. Here's the way the profit and loss graph looks for the entire strategy. Let's walk through the different circumstances. If the stock finishes below 52, then the calls are out of the money. They're worthless. The puts are in the money. So we go through the exercise and assignment process, um, selling shares at 58, buying them back at 52. That's what we're obligated to do, and capturing the full $6. Uh, I'll emphasize again, you know, learning options is all about repetition. If that stock price is really close to your 52 line, then the uncertainty of assignment exists. Uh, if you don't want to end up with short stock and the stock is close to 52, then you can only do one thing, close the 52s, which means close the whole spread to the downside. If the stock is in between uh, 52 and 64, uh, then we have uh, either spread on the outside wor expiring worthless. We have profitability then determined on where is the stock in between these two levels. We have the 58 put. We have the 58 call. Where is the stock? We're not quite sure if that's going to be a, an unrealized gain or an unrealized loss. We'll have to see 
uh, how that plays out, but um, the profitability of the trade will be determined by uh, where the stock is in relation to 58. We paid 350 up front, so we know exactly where our break even points, 61 half to the upside, 54 half to the downside. We paid three and a half up front. We need to pull back three and a half from the market in order to break even. That will happen if either of the options is in the money at expiration by $3.50, and those are the two strike prices that will do it. Now, looking at these two strategies, as I have some things to say here. Uh, I've already pointed out a few of them. The, uh, the maximum gain is likely going to be lower uh, when you have the condor. And again, these comparisons somewhat um, are dependent on your strike price selection. There's some flexibility there with when and how you choose your strike prices. But if you're choosing relatively similar or comparable strike prices with ranges that are somewhat similar, then these comparisons will be true. And the P&L graphs really speak for themselves as you compare the two. Visually, it comes through a little bit crystal clear. The potential gain on the fly is likely going to be a little bit higher because you have higher premiums involved and you're taking on more risk as well. So the potential net gain uh, likely a bit higher. The risk reward ratio, probably higher on the condor uh, versus the iron fly. Uh, break even points, I already mentioned this, narrow, more narrow break even points you would expect on the fly versus the condor. And again, it's that trade off. We paid more for the fly. So we would want to start profiting at quicker levels on both the upside and downside and you would expect that to be true. And then probability of success, really goes hand in hand with the, the previous, uh, with the previous line of break even points, higher probability of success because we start to make money at better and more favorable price levels on the fly versus the, uh, the condor. Now with the fly, one thing I wanna point out here is volatility exposure. I, I said I'd get into a little bit about that. Uh, Remember back at the beginning, I said these trades when you're buying options, regardless of the, the short options that are involved, when you're buying options, you're trying to capitalize on a move. You want movement in the stock for calls up, for puts down when you're buying them. By doing so, you're exposing yourself to volatility. You have Vega exposure. Vega is the measure of how much does an options price change when volatility changes. So volatility is moving all the time. I said before, it's implied volatility. We have an assumption today of what's going to happen in stock price between today and expiration. But tomorrow or next week or even later today, that assumption of how volatile that stock might be is going to change. In fact, volatility changes all the time. So you have exposure when you buy options that if the volatility assumption between today and expiration date for whatever reason starts to decline, then our option prices are going to start to decline. Even if the stock doesn't move, those prices are going to start to decline. We also know that with each passing day, with shorter and shorter time till expiration, the options are going to lose value. But specific on the volatility exposure, the center strikes here, I said we're buying a straddle. That is the most direct exposure to volatility you could possibly get is buying or selling an at-the-money straddle. And for a period of time in my career, it, I did that professionally. For one of the trading firms I worked for back in the late 90s, there was a portfolio that me and a team of other traders worked on called the volatility portfolio. And what we would do, this was a sophisticated analysis that I don't do anymore, most investors won't do, but we had a team of financial engineers who would extract data from the exchanges on implied volatility, and they would look at today's implied volatility across hundreds of different equity symbols and compare it to historic levels of implied volatility. Don't confuse that with historic levels of stock volatility. Historic levels of option volatility versus today's level of options implied volatility, and compare the two. And then they'd send us trade ideas and say, hey, look, to the trading team, look, this." For the stock, today's implied is higher than the historic levels of implied. Option volatility today is higher than option volatility historically has been based on the data we're seeing. And those would be potential sell signals for us. We, of course, have to vet those thoroughly, look at our portfolio, look at what's going on in the market. There might be a very good reason why volatility is higher today than in the past. But we had to look at that. And of course, same thing on the downside. 
If today's implied vol is lower than historic levels of implied vol, we would check that and those would be potential buy signals. The whole point of saying that is not to get too much into detail on how we did that, but when we did decide to execute trades, they were straddles. The entire portfolio was made up of straddle trades. When we decided to execute a buy side trade, it was calling the floor, calling a broker, saying, how's the at the money straddle looking in this stock? And if we wanted to buy it, we went ahead and did that. And on the sell side, it was the same thing. Calling down to the floor and getting a market on the at the money straddle and, and trading that. So there's no more direct exposure than you can have with respect to volatility in Vega than the straddle. And on the butterfly, you have that type of exposure. One other thing I want to mention uh, is with respect to buying options and noticing maybe things that don't look quite crystal clear. We're trying to make money on the buy call or the buy put, or the buy put side. So what happens if we get a move that we, that we thought we were going to get, but we didn't make money? So one of the most frustrating things that I hear from especially those who start trading options, I bought a call option or I bought a put option, a stock moved and I didn't make any money on the trade. And I can give you a, an example with numbers not too long ago. I got a call from an investor uh, who was trading a stock. It was in the low 30s. Uh, they, they bought a 33 strike call option and the stock was up about 5, 6% a few days later, trading up into the mid 30s. And they called and said, I didn't make any money on this trade. What happened? And I said, first of all, was there an earnings announcement? I knew the answer already, but it was there an earnings announcement. Yes, there was. Okay. And then I asked, well, what was the implied volatility level of the option when you bought it? And I knew the answer to that question too. He said, I didn't know. So, okay, well, I've got those two details down. Well, when I look back at this particular stock, I could see that the 52 week range was 22 to 49, quite a bit of a range. I could also see, based on its history of earnings, that it was moving anywhere between 12 and 20% after every earnings announcement. So, believe it or not, for this stock, a 5% move after earnings was nothing. And the options market priced that in prior to the announcement. So this investor bought a call option, didn't pay much attention to the price they were paying or the implied volatility level that they were paying. They just bought a call thinking, if the stock moves up, I'm going to make money. Earnings comes out, stock moves 5%. This investor thought that was a good move, but it wasn't enough. Because volatility crushed after the earnings announcement, it was a smaller move than this stock had done in the past. In fact, it was a similar move that this stock does on any old trading day and the investor lost money on their call. So you have to be familiar uh, with how that works. Now how about the puts? Similarly, you can buy a put option, the stock can move in your favor, and you might not make money. And I have a little bit better story about that one. This goes back maybe a year, uh, year and a half. And I'm gonna in inject some volatility skew discussion into this uh, as well. Stock was trading about $100 a share and the investor bought a put option, I think it was the 85 strike put option, goes out two or three months thinking the stock is going to decline. And when I heard uh, this from this investor, the stock was trading in the high 80s. So we had over a 10% move lower in the stock price. That's a pretty big move. And the option that was purchased for $9 was trading for about 10. And this investor called and said, well, wait a minute, the stock moved over 10% from 100 down into the 80s, I'm getting ripped off. Who's ripping me off on this trade? And of course, at, at first glance, the first thing I could see was this option was trading at 10. And I mean buyers and sellers and hundreds of contracts trading at 10. So immediately I knew that's a fair price. You can't argue with the market's price when there are buyers and sellers exchanging at that price. There's nothing wrong with the market in that situation. So now dig a little deeper. Well, what happened? What was announced? Of course, again, earnings came out. This was a stock that was all over the place as far as high, low, and in between levels. But something else also happened here. If you look at the volatility skew, I said earlier that each strike price has its own volatility level. And I'm going to try and quickly visually draw how that looks without thinking about any strike prices in particular, but looking at strikes as if they were deltas. Now normally, your at the money option, let's say that's your 50 delta option, has an implied volatility level that compared to the others is fairly low. And if you plotted that on a graph, it would be for the most part at the low end of this curve. As you go down and strike on the put side, 
to your 40 delta put, then 30, then 20, then 10, the implied volatility levels of those strikes get higher. They increase. So if you connect those dots, you can see from the low put strikes to the at the money strike, you have this downward sloping curve. And then when you go up to the call side, to generalize, it somewhat flattens out. There's a bit of a curve usually on the call side as well, but it mostly flattens out. And that's not the side of the curve that I'm thinking about here. That put side can have all sorts of different levels of steepness to it. The difference between the 10 delta and 20 delta and 30 delta can be relatively flat, could be elevated, but relatively flat, or very, very steep. In this case with the example that I just outlined, the steepness was extraordinary. Very high steep levels of implied volatility between the different deltas of the puts. Now, when the stock was at 100 and this investor bought the 85 put, maybe it was a 20 delta. Think about how high that implied volatility level was. The 20 delta put was way down on the curve at a very high level. When the stock moved down into the high 80s or at 90, now that option, the 85 put, is a 40 delta put or 45 delta put. So even if the implied volatility level overall did not move, that strike price, what I'll say is slid down the curve and became a much lower implied volatility level than it was when it was far out of the money. Does that make sense, sort of, visually? It slid down the curve. Now, in addition to that, with an earnings announcement, the entire curve moved down. And you can see that options will change value based on either one of those factors with respect to volatility. The entire curve may move up, in that case, implied volatility in that stock moved up, or the entire curve might move down, or the stock may be moving to a different point on the curve because it's now at the money, or it's now in the money. And volatility can fluctuate in that way. A deep understanding of that is not necessary to trade options or to buy options, but it's good to know that and hear it a few times because if you buy an option, or even if you sell it for that matter, and you're tracking the price action as the stock moves, as announcements are made, and as volatility changes, it'll help you understand how the premium or the price of your option is changing along with it. That can be very confusing when you're trading options for the first time. So trading these uh, strategies, certainly you have exposures across the board, and hopefully that gives you an idea of, of a little bit about volatility and skew and how that works from a somewhat basic level. Uh, to wrap that up, you know, what we're trying to do here in general today is, is to give you more ideas to trade. When you're trading stocks, you can buy or sell. That's about it. When you trade options, there's all sorts of things that you can do. There's only four sides. We have calls and puts, you can buy or sell either one. There's four sides to an options trade, but the whole world is open to you to put those trades together into two or three, or in this case, four pieces, and to change expirations and change quantities and do all sorts of different things. The strategies we're outlining are the more common strategies that have well-known names, but you can put together anything you want that is fit to your market outlook and your market analysis. Tweak these trades, do something different. They don't have to be equidistant from each other in strike price width. You can change that. You can do whatever you want to, to tailor the trade uh, to yourself. All in all, the strategies we went through predominantly are buying options, which means the risk involved with buying options is 100% of the premium paid, and you know that going in. We also had calculated risk trades, something that a lot of investors uh, certainly prioritize when they trade options, especially from the buy side. Calculating your risk can certainly be uh, a priority. Now, before we wrap up, uh, are there any questions from the live audience? Sir. You mentioned historical and implied volatility. Is, is it correct to say that the historical is listed with the stock itself, or the implied is part of the option pricing? It, so the question is, is it fair to say that historical volatility is specific to the stock and implied volatility is specific to the option? and that is 100% correct. Historic volatility is also called realized volatility, and it's calculated by looking at past stock price movements and 
spitting out a volatility level of how volatile has this stock been in the past. And you can choose different ranges of intervals, a 30-day historic volatility, a 60-day, a 90-day, to your liking, and that number will tell you a fact. This is what the stock has done in the past. The options market is trying to price in the possibility of, of movements in the future. So while historic volatility is used to help gauge what that level should be, they're likely not going to match up because tomorrow's volatility very well might not be what happened yesterday. So investors and trading firms will often start by looking at historic volatility, uh, historical volatility as they develop their assumptions for implied volatility. Uh, but yes, implied is only specific to the options contract itself. And some people might say that uh, because of the nature of selling options and the risk associated with it, uh, that implied volatility may generally always be a little bit higher than historic volatility. Just like selling insurance, they want a little bit of premium to sell you that insurance. Sir. question is, is how to screen for overpriced or underpriced options. And I, I don't have a, a location for you to go, but how that would be done with respect to overpriced, it's all about volatility. When someone says this option is too expensive, what they're saying is implied vol is too high. And when it's cheap, implied vol is too low. So how do you make that determination? It's comparing the implieds to each other. As I said before, historic volatility is very important and useful when determining what implied should we use, but once you have that level, you want to compare it to past level of implied volatility to see is it too high or is it too low, and is there a reason for that? A platform or a screener would need to do that, and you certainly might be able to find one. There's certainly some out there, I just can't name them specifically, that in their opinion, this option is trading with an implied volatility level that's higher than it should be. And that's what they're telling you with too expensive and, and too cheap. Sorry, I can't be more direct with that. And that's, that's going to be out of time for session two. Uh, thank you very much for your attention on that. We'll take a short break. We'll be back in about 15 minutes, and we'll take care of session three. Thanks, folks.